So everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, June meeting for the uh, North Star Water Media Society. Um, our guest artist tonight is Michael Reardon. He's been painting watercolor for over 30 years. He's an avid traveler. He's traveled worldwide as well as throughout our country. And uh, he likes to record his observation using the watercolor medium. Um, in 2005, he was the recipient of the prestige prestigious Gabriel Prize from the Western European Architecture Foundation. Uh, this enabled him uh, to spend three months painting in Paris. What a life. Um, sounds like it was really fun. Um, his watercolors have been exhibited nationally and internationally, including the annual shows of the National Watercolor Society, the American Watercolor Society, and the California Art Club. He is also a signature member of all those groups, uh, as well as the American Watercolor Society. Um, he spent 30 years as a architectural illustrator. He's actually trained as an architect. And uh, I think tonight in his presentation, he's gonna focus on one painting that maybe go through the seven steps of this one painting. He, if you've gone to his website, you'll see that his uh, paintings really play on light and shadow. And um, they're not simple in, 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 a, in a literal sense, but they're simple forms that really resonate when you start playing with that light and shadow. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Michael and uh, he's gonna walk us through his seven step process. I think he's gonna paint a, a church tonight. So right. uh, Michael. It's all yours. All right. Well, thank you all for, um, I'm always a little bit uh, surprised how many people want to watch me paint. Um, the way it's going to work this evening is that um, this, this, uh, the painting is actually pre-recorded. So um, I will be narrating it live though. Um, you know, a year ago, I'd never done any of this video stuff. And so I learned, I think, learned quickly and learned how to kind of uh, film some of my demonstrations. And uh, it, uh, you know, we have close-ups and th there's lots of editing you can do that actually makes it far superior to, uh, you know, especially back in the days when you had a mirror behind you or something like that. So you can actually see what's going on. So um, let's get started. Um, and uh, again, feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm, since I'm not painting, I actually can have a little more, uh, a little more attention. So... So this is a painting that I call L'Eglise sur Mer. It's, it's actually completely invented. There's no um, real place. Um, I always do a value study, like as you can see, a pencil study. But this actually, there, there's an old lighthouse. I'm gonna pause right here. There's an old lighthouse um, underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, the North Tower of the Golden Gate Bridge. And you can see a painting I did about 10 years ago of it. And so I, when I was thinking, okay, what, what, what do I want to do now? I don't want to do the same painting over again. So I created a little French church in the French village and got rid of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, I, I, I was an architectural illustrator, so I actually it's quite comfortable for me to move things around and change things. But I think it'd be a little more interesting story than doing the same thing over again. So I really want to reiterate, I do this pencil line study. I do it for every single painting I do, this value study. And then I, I take it from there. I'll be using Saunders Waterford 140 pound rough. Um, and here's my palette. Let me just pause here also real quickly. So you can see, I, I, I don't use many colors. I mean, the cobalt blue, the cerulean blue, the ultramarine blue are kind of my, my go-to blues. I go through lots and lots of cobalt blue, for example. And instead of the earth tones, I use these quinacridone colors. So instead of burnt sienna, I use quinacridone burnt scarlet and quinacridone burnt orange. And then I use permanent orange. You can see from my palette, there aren't that many paints and probably 90% of the time, these are the colors I use. Um, I can make almost any color I want from the colors that are in my palette, but we can really concentrate on just these few. So if I start saying quinacridone, you'll know that I mean uh, the burnt scarlet or the burnt orange. Um,
you know, the thing about this palette, I have all my primaries and that's really all, all you need. So for my brushes, I'll be using the Isabay number six, the silver black velvet number 16 and the silver black velvet number 12. Most of the painting will be done with the number 12, just the larger washes, I use the bigger brushes. All right, I'm gonna start here. I always do an underpainting. And with an underpainting, you, you can see my line work real fast here. You can see I, I've got a fair amount of detail, not a whole lot of detail, but just enough so that I don't have to be thinking constantly of, um, you know, okay, what am I gonna do next? So when I do an underpainting, I'm gonna be using cobalt blue and, and permanent orange. And before I start, I make uh, puddles of it. So, and again, I mentioned, I just mentioned the primaries. Well, with these two colors, I have all three primaries represented at the blue and the red and the yellow and the orange. If you combine them, you'll, you'll make a gray. Yeah, and the other really important part of this, especially in this painting, is that I've got a warm color and a cool color. Again, 80% of the time, these are just the two colors I use. I use sometimes uh, other colors. But so this is going to be kind of a uh, think of non fat to low fat consistency wash over the entire painting. And I'll just be preserving the areas that are pure white. And the only pure white in this painting is the front of the church and the rock that's in front of it. So um, everything else will, I'll, I'll be using a graduated wash from the top, as you'll see just in a few minutes. And I go all the way down the page, bring everything with the exception of um, the few areas on the church. So I'm gonna, the idea here, the, the light is coming from the left-hand side. And so I want this kind of sunset look. So I'm actually starting with orange, um, going all the way across. And I'm adding a little bit more water as we go down because, so I'm just starting with the orange. And I'm, you can see I just preserving that one area on the, on, on the front face of the church, unpainted. And I'm painting very carefully around the front face of the church as well. So you can see there's a speed of water. My, my, my board is at an angle. So you can see I keep the speed of water going down the page. This is the you know, great graduated wash of 101. And then I take the cobalt blue and I begin to blend it in into the orange, just one big wash over everything. And you'll, you'll find that when I'm all done, you'll think, oh, these, all of these areas look white, but that actually won't, some will be warm whites, some will be cool whites. The other thing that this underpainting does, it really kind of helps it tie the whole painting together. It establishes the sense of light, but also just really begins to um, tie everything together. So you can also begin to see, now I'm getting down to the washer where there are some waves. And I should also put on, on the left-hand side, it's almost just pure water. I mean, it look, it, it's gonna look white by the time I'm done, but, but it has a slight tone to it. And then as I get down to the water, I'm using mostly cobalt blue. And I'm not too, too worried about the splashes and things like that. And because I, these are the tops of the waves, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna make it a little rougher here and a few little white spots here and there um, while it's still, while it's still wet. And then, and then from that point, I just take the blue all the way down the page and that's the underpainting. So you can see the underpainting itself takes, you know, just a few minutes, but, but I think it's a critical step. All my lighter values, my values one through three are now most, mostly done. Um, so this, the center painting serves many purposes. And uh, one of them is just that um, establish, establishing your, your, your lightest values. So I'm just picking out a few of the little tops of the waves. I mean, you know, in San Francisco Bay where this was, painting was based on, there are no waves like this, but I, I wanted to have some waves. So you can see where we're going. So now I'm gonna paint the little background mountains and the little French village on the hills that behind everything else. And for this, I'll be using basic, the same two colors, the cobalt blue and the permanent orange. 
Um, so instead of being kind of non-fat milk, we're maybe going to be using more like 2% milk because I want the background to stay very, very light. And so I'm again, going to kind of mix these colors on my palette, but you'll see, I do a lot of mixing on the paper as well. I, I should also point out before we go too much further, I have let my paper dry completely. So I, I don't do it while it's wet. It's really important to, I let my paper dry, absolutely bone dry. So I, I, I really enjoy watercolor when you can mix on the paper and let the, let, let the um, pigments kind of intermingle. And um, it creates much more visual interest rather than just mixing it on my palette. I will sometimes mix larger areas on my palette, but if I can mix them on the, uh, on the paper, it, it, it's significantly, uh, more interesting. And I should also, yeah, I'm also starting the mountain behind it um, with kind of the cooler blue I really wanted to, wanted to receive. So the way I, I paint comes from, uh, excuse me if this gets a little bit out of focus, sometimes the camera focuses on, on my head, not, not the paper. Um, I paint kind of all in one go. So I will paint an area and I will get it to the value that I want and then I'll stop and I will not touch it again. So I paint, I'm left-handed. So I'm actually starting on the right-hand side so I don't put my hand in wet paint. Um, and I will paint each area until it's the value that I want. And then I'll move on to the next area. But while it's still wet, of course, I can blend things together and you'll, you wouldn't know. And so once I paint this background, for example, I, I will not touch it again. So I'm really striving at this point to um, just get that kind of light, uh, let's say values three to four. Um, I, I, and here I, I, I can tell that it's not quite, it's a little too light. So I'm dropping in a little bit more of the the, the darker cobalt blue into it. The reason I use cobalt blue for the backgrounds here is that cobalt blue is, um, you can never make it dark. And unlike ultramarine blue, as we'll see later, is how I make my darks. So I just keep moving along for me from left to right, and I'm right to left and um, and here, down here, I, I, again, I want this feeling that there's kind of mist. So when I get down to the bottoms of these buildings, I'm going to most, mostly be using some hot water, some uh, uh, pure water, just so it feels like there's some kind of foggy mist on the water. You know, what? You, you, we went pretty quickly by my value study. But when I was doing my value study, I was thinking about things like this. Do I want it to be kind of misty? Do I want it to be kind of... Um, sharp. In this case, I really thought, okay, let's play with, play with some mist on, on the water. All right, so the background buildings are mostly now all done. And um, the, uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier that I, I, I paint Lots of light and shadow, but the secret of the secret of creating light is having shadow. We got to have the dark side in order for the light side to uh, to pop out. So most of this painting, we're only going to be painting the shadow, the areas of the of the building, the mountains, anything that's in shadow. So I'm constantly thinking, thinking, and I've got my value study, right? You can see it underneath, uh, underneath my hand. I will be painting all of these things in shadow, all of the, the shade and shadow pattern throughout. So Michael, this is Arch. Um, yeah. Are you still using the cobalt blue or are you introducing other blues? It's in only cobalt blue, only okay. cobalt blue and permanent orange, the only two colors that are, that are being used right now for the background. You can see when they mix together, um, 
it becomes kind of a gray, but I wanted this to be to lean towards the blue because cool colors like blues recede and warm colors come, come forward. Yep. But you can begin to see why, why I do it on the paper. By having that orange in there, the blue really pops out where the blue makes the orange pop out. And it's just more, much more visually interesting rather than mixing one big wash. See, I, I started out mostly as a plein air painter. Um, that's really how I learned. And so this technique that's kind of painting very directly comes from my experience um, painting outdoors where you don't want to spend a whole lot of time. And so I learned to paint very directly. I, in my illustration career, I actually did much more of the classic step for French wash. Um, but when I went outside to paint, I, well, I, want, I wanted to paint quickly. So I'm just hinting at while, while the wash is still wet, you know, just dropping in some trees or just a little, make me a little more interest there on the, uh... when I painted this, it was a very cool foggy day. So the, the washes weren't drying very quickly. Um, there's, a, there's an old saying that I, that there's a reason that the British do watercolors and the Navajos do sand painting. There's no <laughs> doubt that um, the humidity makes the paints flow much more nicely than they, than they would otherwise. So I'm just kind of hinting at these background. And the thing about a background, I mean, I always, and again, in my value study, I always make sure I have a foreground, middle ground, and a background. Um, backgrounds tend to be very light like this. Your subject matter, your focal point, which I haven't gotten into too much yet, um, is in your middle ground. But, you, but the foreground really helps to create the illusion of depth. All of these, using these three planar um, aspects, I don't know what you would you call them, um, are really the way to um, create a, a feeling of depth. So in this particular case, the, the church and all the buildings are my middle ground and the waves and the rocks in the foreground. So again, I wanted this mist. So when I got down to the book, you can see, I, I didn't even dry, draw a horizon line. I just put the water in just so it feels like the, there's, there's mist on the water. You know, there, I, I really, as you'll see throughout this, I, I try to suggest things and using mist is actually a great way of suggesting things. So I'm just kind of using clear water to smooth it out. And then there's a little piece of background underneath the uh, underneath the bridge. So, Michael, this is Art again. Uh, what what uh, manufacturer of paints do you prefer? Oh, uh, these are all Daniel Smith. Okay. Uh, with the exception of my ultramarine blue, which is Holbein. I, I, I've been using Daniel Smith colors for a long time. Um, I right now is the uh, ultramarine blue from Holbein. Daniel Smith's ultramarine blue, sadly, it's a great color, but it dries like palette. So um, I switched to Holbein. I, I should point out that part of the, I mean, Daniel Smith's paints are more expensive generally, um, but it's because they put so much pigment in, the, in them. When I use this ultramarine blue from Holbein, I go through many, many tubes of it because it has much more filler in it. But it, it, it flows really nicely and it doesn't dry like a rock in my palette. So. But these are all Daniel Smith colors. I started using them probably, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. And yeah, you, well, if we ever do a workshop together, I will talk to you about pigments because I, I, I'm actually a bit of a pigment nerd. Um, I, for me, I, mean, I know a lot of teachers. So now we're using ultramarine blue and quinacridone burnt orange. So I, I should put that up first. So I, I want these, this is the, mi the middle ground of these buildings. I want, really want these to be darker. So the only way to use, make them darker you could, is to use the ultramarine blue. And instead of burnt sienna, I'm using quinacridone burnt orange. And you can see I'm mixing on the palette. Um, I mean, on the paper. So to finish that thought, I, I think understanding your, your pigments is very, very important. And I could 
tell you the reasons why in another point, but um, for me, it's very, very important to know what they do. I mean, you can see over time, I, 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 the number of pigments I use has, has shrunk um, considerably. And I really think, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, oh, let's try this color, but uh, ultimately the success of a realistic landscape painting is getting your values right. And color adds the helps to add the mood and the feeling. But if you don't get your values right, it's never gonna work. So, um, and this is particularly true of architectural subjects. Uh, it's true with everything, but really with architecture, if you just paint the shadow pattern of, of a building, it'll look like a building. I mean, you can see here, I'm just, I decided to get rid of that white spot. Um, and, and notice also, I'm working from top to bottom. I keep that bead going the entire time. And my paper is probably at about a, I don't know, 25 degree angle. So it really helps to keep that bead going. As long as you keep that bead going, you can just then blend in the next area and it'll just flow, flow along. But you can see how many, just using these, the warm and cool colors of these two, the blue and, and the burnt orange. Um, again, just like the, the, the background, having that warm and cool tension um, really helps. I, I, I think a lot of painting is um, about creating contrast and working with contrast. And in painting, we all know about value contrast, dark and light will always you know, help attract the eye. But I think one of the unsung heroes of, of watercolor paint, of any kind of painting really, is the warm, cool contrast. Um, of course, complementary colors work with that as well, but um, warm, having warms and cools can really create a lot of excitement in paintings. So I'm throwing a little bit of the quinacridone burnt scarlet in at this point. Um, you can see it's turning a little more purplish. The burnt scarlet just has more red in it. So I will be using just those two colors, mostly for the buildings, I'll be using the, mostly the burnt orange, but I'll occasionally throw in the burnt scarlet, especially on the rocks when we do the rocks. Um, for visual interest. So I really want to get this value, because as, as we know, watercolors dry and much, much lighter than when you first put them down. And so I'm really checking these to make sure that this is, the, this is gonna be dark enough by the time it dries. It's, it's really tough, especially at the beginning of painting, um, because you have all of these light areas around it. So you think, oh, that's dark enough, but once you start putting in the real darks, because these are still pretty mid middle value-ish, um, you know, six or seven, and or five even. Um, yeah, so I really want to make sure. So here on the rocks, I'm going to go a little bit darker. So, and of course, with watercolor, the only way to make it darker is to have more pigment. So um, I can use my dairy analogies, you know, in the background we were using non-fat milk and then a little bit of 2% milk on the, on, the, on the buildings and the mountains. And now we're using kind of cream, uh, full, full milk to, to cream actually, or half and half. So you also say I just threw that little piece of, uh, of the burnt orange lighter. I, I will throw in little accents now and then. You know, if you go back and look at the, the impressionist, um, whenever they would have a green field with flowers, they always put some little dashes of red in it or something because they were really working a lot with the, um, with the complementary colors as well as, and war, as well as warms and cools. So with these rocks, I feel like I'd be a little freer um, as far as what colors I'm putting down. But next skin, it's just these three colors, the ultramarine blue, quinacridone burnt orange and quinacridone burnt scarlet. And all I'm doing, as you can see, I'm just painting the shadow, the, the shaded side of the buildings and the rocks. I'm leaving little highlights there at the top of the rock, um, which we'll fill in at, at, at the, much, much later. Where that occurs here. So at this point, it is kind of creamy. I, and this is just the ultramarine blue with uh, 
quinacridone burnt orange. But, but because there's so much water in the paint on the page, I don't have to be adding water to my brush very much. I can almost take it straight out of the tube and drop it into the paper while it's still wet. And that's how I get the, that's how I create my darts. So the tops of the waves, it, it's, it's, it's negative painting. Um, so I'm, hit, I'm hitting the, the tops of the waves. I'm gonna kind of paint them now by messing up the rocks there at the bottom. I should also point out that you see on, on the building, there's that bead underneath there. I'm really watching it because I want to go back into that while it's still wet. I mean, I've broken this painting up into seven steps, but I actually never stop. Once I start, I just go from, after the underpainting, I, I just go from, um, from the right-hand side to the bottom, you hit the bottom and done usually. And so, so I'm really kind of messing this up. This is the, the mist, I'm taking a little paper towel, um, create a little bit of mist there at the bottom of the rocks. And this is all, this is all faith, you know. I, I, I actually grew up in, in Southern California near the beach. So I, I try to channel my inner um, Southern Californian um, when I'm painting waves. So this is just, so this is an example of negative painting. Um, so I've gone back to the whole milk, I mean the 2% milk, or pure water even in, in a few places and just kind of dragging the paint down because it's just the tops of the waves. And while this is still wet, I, I wanna make sure the things are, it's really important at this point to get your real darks that you want. And, and I can tell it's drawing a little bit too light. So while the paper's still wet, you can drop these colors in. If you wait and then try to do it later, you'll lose that luminosity that you get with watercolor. Um, of course it can be done, but I, I can tell you every student in a workshop, everyone tries it and then they find out that, um, and it takes practice knowing how, how much pigment to put in at this stage, but it really helps to create the luminosity. So we're gonna move on to the left and do the rocks and the bridge next. Um, I show these little pictures of the final painting just to remind you about where we're going. So this is already, feel, uh, do you ever step back as you're painting just to kind of? Occasionally, briefly, but because I'm working so much wet and wet, um, I really have to work kind of quickly. Um, but I, I do now and then. You know, the thing is, is I, I, what you're not seeing is I, I've got that value study. You can see on the left-hand side right with me. And I'm always looking over at it thinking, okay, am I getting the values that I want? And if I feel like I got the values that I want, which I do now on those, those rocks, I think uh, are done. Um, the shadow side on the building on the right is mostly done. Um, yeah, it's entirely done. We'll throw, we'll throw some windows in at the very end after it's dry. But... So I, I had some, by the way, I did have some windows drawn in there. I just painted right over them because uh, I know that the windows are gonna be darker. So you can see the value study again. It's just really, I, I use it the, the entire painting. Plus, I don't like putting my hand on the paper, so I use it as my uh, as my little basis for. So, how do you how do you transpose the the drawing elements of the value study, which is smaller, to the larger piece that you're painting on? Well, I do it a number of different ways. Um, I, since I was an illustrator, I actually have a light table. Okay. So, so I will take them and, and it depends on the, on the painting with that I'm using. I, I will often take it and use those little tick marks, you know, create, I, I don't draw the grid, but I'll kind of divide the painting and, you know, quarters horizontally and, and vertically. And then I'll make that on the, uh, and then I use a piece of tracing paper and I'll kind of draw it again at a larger size, whatever size I want. And then I use the light table to transfer it actually onto the watercolor paper. If I'm, if I'm painting outdoors, I, I just go directly, I, I, of course, I don't have a light table, so I just go directly to, um, to I just do the ticks on my watercolor paper mm -hmm. and just go directly to that. Uh, 
I actually enjoy the um, value studies, the sketches, more than I do the final paintings. Because to me, that's where all the creativity happens. Um, So what, what, yeah, actually, notice one other thing I'm doing here to, to a certain extent is I'm linking things together. I'm glad that worked out right now. I really, it's really very important to me that um, all of these shapes to the extent, extent possible all kind of become one shape. In composition, there's kind of a rule of thumb that the fewer number of shapes, the stronger the composition. And so you can see I have made all of this one shape by linking everything together. We've got that window and that shadow up there on top of the building, but, the one, but for the most part, these are just, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very important for me to link things. If I see things kind of like sitting out by themselves, I try to figure out how, how to bring them back into the painting. And you know when when paint the building I again I, I'm an architect so it's kind of difficult for me to make sure when, when the perspective's not right or the building's not right but with the rocks I have a little more freedom. So you can also begin to see now look at the little piece of the background you see behind there and you can see how light it is and this and this because this is darker this is jumping out. Yeah, th there are people who can transfer and just by eye. I, I find that I need to um, use a grid or something to, you know, if, and, and as long as I get a few areas that are, that are correct, then I can just wing it from that point on. But starting out, it's really important to like, know, make sure that side of the building is, you know, in the right location. So which colors are you, are you using now? The same colors, ultramarine blue, quinacrylone blue, orange and quinacrylone burnt scarlet. You can see on my palette right there, there's a little bit of mixing going on. Those are the two quinacridones. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I can tell this area is still not gonna be dark enough. So I'm taking it, I didn't add any water to my brush. I just took it right out of the um, well basically. And I'm using the water and that's, on the paper. You know, the thing was when I do this little value study, um, I then have an image in my head of what I'm trying to do. And so I, I'm looking at it, but, but I've already fixed in my mind what I want to do. So I'm gonna throw a little bit of the burnt orange in here, just for some, um, I mean, excuse me, permanent orange just to create a little more variety because I, it's getting a little monotonous. Um, so I will occasionally throw in kind of a dessert color as I call it now and then. But again, it's either gonna be quinacridone, you know, one of the two quinacridones or, or the permanent orange. And more often than not, it's the quinacridones. Permanent orange like cobalt blue will never ever become dark. So um, if I want darks, I have to use I have to use the ultramarine mix. So here's the tops of the other waves here. So and, and you can maybe see that I, I when I drew the waves, I just kind of threw some little lines in just so I would know where they were. But I'm as far as exactly how these waves work, I have quite a bit of liberty. But look within this wash, you can see that there's that burnt scarlet jumping out. There's some of that burnt orange jumping out. Um, but when you stand back and look at it, it just gonna, it looks like one big color. I mean, you get, get a sense right now that it just looks like one value. But there's so much variety within each wash. So moving on to the bridge. I'll, I'll just say one thing about bridges. I'm, I'm not doing it too much. Bridges and archways you should really pay attention to the, the color of the shadow underneath bridges and archways. Generally speaking, they reflect the color 
of the ground. So they tend to be warmer. Next time you add an archway or something like that, look at it, you'll see. And all the other colors that ha I go to more towards the blues because they're reflecting the color of the sky. So the sides of buildings, generally speaking, are cooler color, except when they get close to the bottom of it, then they, then they warm up. It's, it, it's all reflected light. And, um, and to trace much, it's more realistic actually, but uh, it's not something that most people see though, or have been trained to see. Well, you can see how I linked the bridge now into that other wash as well. Let's talk about linkages. And there's the, you know, the, the pastor and his assistant um, on their way to church. So you can see how, how quickly I, I, I do paint, but the only way I, I can paint quickly is by having a picture in my head. And I, I should also say that I, whenever I finish a painting, I think it's the worst thing in the world because it didn't match that image in my head, but um, then I put it away for a few days and then besides, usually, usually besides it's not so bad. On, on the other hand, if you think, oh, I really nailed it this time, then often it's like, oh, it's not, what was I thinking? It's not so good. All right, we're gonna move on to the church and the rocks. Um, again, I want this all linked together. I'm not stopping here. Um, so we have a we have a question from someone who um, probably came in late. Um, could you just give us a brief overview again of your Daniel Smith color palette that you're using? Okay, I, I think she might mean the actual palette too. Oh, okay, the actual palette itself. Um, of the palette that I use. Yes. Yeah. It's actually it's a it's a handmade palette by a guy here in Oakland who, um, actually an architect, who started making pallets uh, several years ago when, when things were slow. And so I traded in the painting for it. It's a great pallet. <laughs> um, he's gone back to architecture, not doing it anymore. But there are these metal brass pallets that, uh, I, he, he learned how to do it because there are some very nice ones, but they're very expensive. And so mm -hmm. he made, started making them for himself. If that's what is that, if that's what you're talking about, then they're not available anymore. Unfortunately, I I, I love it. In fact, I, I've stopped traveling with it because it was getting battered too much by the airlines. So, um, but it's really a fantastic palette. I mean, it's a great size. Um, but you can see, I, I, I mean, because I'm using so many of these colors, I basically just have a few wells, I mean, the mixing wells um, that I'm using. See here now I can, I can link the bridge into the building. So it feels like one. So, so for most of the building side that we're about to do, uh, I'll, I'll, it's all ultramarine blue and quinacridone burnt orange. You can see right there, ultramarine blue, quinacridone burnt orange. Ultramarine blue, go ahead and burn orange. But I do mix a little bit on the palette, but I'm really, for the most part, um, mixing on the paper. And actually, sometimes I feel like it's just getting too monotonous. I'll, I'll throw in another color, like you can see some of the orange on the top of that tower. Did, did I answer the question about the palette? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, again, because I it comes from painting plan, plan air, I, I've never used a big palette um, like, you know, the John Pikes and things like that. Um, but it's just that this is easy to carry and fits on my backpack. So, again, I'm just. I want to make sure that this value is what I want. It was also just getting too, too flat. And so while it's still wet, I can um, keep dropping it in. 
So you can see just by putting the shadows or shade on an architectural subject that they immediately read. I often do these paintings where it's kind of, it's basically backlit, meaning the largest area of the painting is in shade. Because the shade is actually Canaletto a long time ago, it's probably apocryphal, he said, it's all in the shadows. And I think it's really true that um, if you get your shadows correct, especially with architectural subjects, and he was pretty good at that stuff, um, your, your painting will read, especially with representation of things like, like uh, architecture. Just so here's the rocks in front of the, in front of the building. I just threw in some quinacridone burnt scar that almost just straight out of the pallet, uh, out of the tube onto it, just again, creates some interest. So here's the top legs and using the same, I have actually a little bit of a familial tremor, so I use it sometimes when I'm doing things like this. Um, but again, putting more and more water in um, and lifting it out with, with a brush now and then just create mist. So we have a question from Barb Parisian. Um, do you ever, in this methodology you're using right now, do you ever put the brush in water or is it just strictly the water that's on there plus the pigment directly out of the water? Oh, no, what, what you, yeah, what you can't see above my palette there on the left hand side is I've got two um, yogurt jars um, full of water. Okay. And so, there were, I have edited the video so I don't go back and forth and putting the water in. But the, when doing those waves, for example, the only way you can, you can get pure water is by rinsing your brush in, in the water. Um, the other question I have is, do you ever use dry brush to create texture like where the waves might uh, rocks? I don't. There's no reason you can't. Um, it's just not something that I learned um, ever really much to use. Um, I, I, I took uh, two workshops in my life. One was with Jean Doby a long time ago when I was doing more of the French wash step stuff. And I also took a, took a workshop with Charles Reed. And I remember when I finished his workshop, this was uh, 20 some years ago, I thought, well, that was nice, but I'll never use this. And then about six months later, I was painting outside and I, and I just clicked. This was this way of painting directly onto the paper. It was something that he does. Um, and it just began to like, oh, I understand now. This could really work well. So this very direct way of, paint, of painting that I have is kind of my takeoff of, of Charles Reed. Of course, what I do is very different than what he does, but the, but the, but the idea behind it um, is very similar. Because he would basically, for the most part, would just put things down once um, and leave it. And I pretty much do the same thing. Do you ever use a hot press paper? When I first started out, Oh, I don't know, long, long time ago. I, I didn't know the difference between hot press and cold press, so I did use some hot press. Um, I, I, I'm a much more of a cold press rough guy. In fact, I used to use only cold press, and I don't know, maybe five years ago. Um, I won't get into my paper discussion too much, but um, I started using Saunders and started using their rough and just kind of fell in love with it because it's really nice. You know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but you can make a smoother wash on rough paper than you can on cold press or hot press. I found hot press just too slick for me. Um, and, you know, it's just, it, it, the, I know people who paint on hot press and get fantastic effects. For me, uh, with this wet and wet thing, I, I just don't think it works very well. So, I mentioned earlier my focal point. So the focal point is the front of the church and that dark rock in front of it. So it's, it's the focal, it's the one point in the entire painting where I have black against white. 
if you go look around in museums, you will always see all representational artists always have a focal point. Um, so when I, you, you can see in my value study, I kind of darken that area a little bit because that's the only place where we have the white of the paper against that dark. It doesn't mean you can't have darks elsewhere, but it's the one place where you'll have the dark against the pure white of the paper. So it was kind of the hook um, from which you do, everything else kind of falls. So again, I'm doing some of the tops of the waves here. So at the very end, we're gonna be putting orange on the roofs and the tops of the rocks. So don't worry, don't think I'm leaving those white, but I'm painting around them right now. Again, we're just painting the shadows and um, all the light stuff is kind of dessert later on. So which artist uh, in your career have you always admired? Um, John Singer Sargent. <laughs> yeah. In fact, he's the, he's, the, he's the reason I do watercolor. So now we're gonna move on to the water. Um, I had actually had a terrible experience in college right, with watercolor and I was so traumatized. I didn't touch it again for 10 years. Um, it just, I won't go into all the details, but um, I thought I'll never learn how to watercolor. And then I saw this John Singer Sargent exhibit at a local museum here. It was um, paintings of Venice. And I resolved that I've got to learn how to do this. So I, he, he's the reason I do this. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like getting, get, getting in a rut. I'll just open up the book again and kind of look at some of these things. I don't paint anything like him, um, but yeah, he's, he's really. So now I'm taking a little bit of cerulean blue with the cobalt blue here for the water. So no ultramarine here at this point. So for the water, I'm, you can see I'm doing these horizontal strokes. Again, this is where the, the bottoms of the waves, this is a little bit on the right-hand side, just a little bit of a rock poking through, through, through the waves. Uh, again, kind of a strengthening in my, my foreground. Um, and again, I've added a little bit of water, painting the undersides of the waves. So I'll be mostly be using the cobalt, only for the water, the cobalt blue and the cerulean blue. Again, cerulean blue, it's a nice granulating color. Um, it will never get all that dark. And it's really a good color for, for water. Actually, it's cousin, which is cobalt turquoise, are, and they're both the same pigment, PB36 just cobalt turquoise. I don't know why they call it cobalt. It has no cobalt in it, but um, it's another great color for kind of more greenish cast water. But you'll always find one of those two in my water. So one other thing which I like to do, well, I, I, I'm strengthening the, the values here on, on the right-hand side just to help to, help to um, get the feeling that the light's coming from the light from the left side and side. But I also like to have something different happening on all four corners. So I wanna make sure that that corner there on the far end is uh, lighter than the one over here on the right. So with the water, you can be ha actually have a lot of fun. You have a lot of freedom. Um, and you can see I kind of wet the paper and then dropping these other colors in while it's still wet. Um, it really helps to kind of feel, make it feel like it's, um, like it's water. But really notice the horizontal strokes, water generally speaking, especially rough water. Um, I, I suppose someone with a dry brush could be doing exactly what I'm doing right now, but um, it, it's not really what, what I'm comfortable. I, I mean, I've used it now and then, but it's not something I, I, I generally use very much. But I'm leaving lots of the previous water wash through here, poking through, especially on the left-hand side. Um, and this is where I am sitting back a little bit looking at this, um, not going up very, really closely, and just making sure that it reads right. 
and I can tell it's not, I mean, it's clearly not dark enough, but I want to get some of these very light um, colors of the waves in there. I threw a little bit of the, of the um, permanent orange in, you just saw me mixing it, um, just to gray it up because these two colors can be kind of intense. I'll often add a little bit of the, it's complement in a lot of these colors, so they're just not so um, bright. Actually, cerulean blue mixes really nicely with the orange, but you don't just, you just need a touch of it. Otherwise, it's just a little bit too bright. So again, I'm working on these waves while they're still wet, trying to get the value that I want, and then I'll never touch them again. Not touching them again really is the way to kind of make things luminous. And then looking at it, I can tell this is still drawing way too light. So um, this is mostly the cerulean blue, which I think has a little bit of, per of the permanent orange in it. You can see it there on the left hand side, uh, right hand side of my palette. Okay, final touches. So um, this is where I mentioned earlier that we go back in and add a lot of the orange. Again, the, the, there's lots of blue and orange in here, but we're going to kind of um, now add the complement to the blue mostly. So with the background, again, I've, I've gone back to the cobalt because I want these windows just to, um, just to be a hint of windows. And because it's completely dry, um, I can just kind of drop those in. But let me make one comment about windows. Um, generally speaking, I don't make little rectangles. I, um, Here's, here's just a little bit of the orange for the orange roof. I always try to make irregular shapes. There's something that it was John Salmon and one of your local Minnesotans said once, he said, you really try to avoid our um, geo firm, strong geometric shapes in a painting unless you want your eye to go there. So he was talking about other things, but it's really true with windows because there's a tendency some, for many people to just make, them, make these little rectangles and they become way too important. So I'm adding a little bit of orange here on this front of this building because I felt like it was just too white. You know, even though I, my, with my underpainting, I went over it, it still was a little just a bit too light. And so I wanted to give it a little bit more of a tone. So it just didn't compete with the church. So it is, I just take almost pure permanent orange and so now I'm making it a little bit stronger here for, the, for these roofs. And I know many people think that, okay, oh, they're way too bright. But you can see I put some of those, the ribs earlier on, the shadows of the ribs. And these permanent orange and many other oranges, they dry much less bright than when you first put them on. You know, I learned this years ago. I, I had been painting outdoors. I was painting in Spain, and there were a lot of red-tiled roofs. And people think red-tiled roofs, they, they immediately grab the red. But in the terracotta color has a little bit of red in it. But it's, mostly, it's mostly orange. And so you can actually create much more visual interest by, by using a light value of orange. So notice the, the windows that I put in there. See how I kind of hinted that you might see something through it, some mullions or something like that. So but when you step back, they look like windows. If you just made strong little rectangles, they, well, one, they wouldn't look real. And two, um, they would just attract way, way too much attention. But to make my black for those windows, I used, again, the same colors, ultramarine blue and quinacridone burnt orange, but I just used a much, um, thicker mix of, mixture of it. 
you know, when you mix all your primaries together, you make gray, but it's also the way you make black. And the classic way for many people to make black and watercolor is ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I just use the burnt orange or occasionally the, sometimes a little bit of the burnt scarlet, depending on what, a, what kind of black I want to make. Again, these, these, these rock walls in front of this building um, are just way too white. And so I'm giving them just a little bit of more of a warm tone, again, so they don't compete with the church too much. Any other questions? Are we? No questions up. I think people are just fascinated with what you're doing, though. Yeah. You know, the thing is, I, I, I really a uh, believer in letting watercolor be watercolor. Um, I admire people who do these photorealistic things. And I, I used to do it in my career, but it's the last thing I want to do. Um, and so like any other medium, with what, no other medium can you blend and have things kind of bleed into each other like you can with watercolor. Um, and because of the luminosity, the colors are just absolutely beautiful. So if you don't overdo it, because they're so pretty, um, you're bound to get a nice painting, or at least a pretty painting anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's a classic though, one more thing, you know, and then see, when I look at this now, I think, okay, the, the buildings on the right hand side should have been darker, you know, so I look at, I know that. But I've also learned that if I go back on top of that and put something on it, um, it's going to ruin the luminosity. And to me, the luminosity is more important than going back in and getting the values right. Um, and be, again, those were the ones that I did first, and I was being a little bit timid. But, but the thing is, when I'm all said and when all said and done, it still looks just fine. So I've made a black again for the for these windows. So when you're facing this building head on, like and this with this build this window, we're we're um, we'll have some little darks. The ones that are re receding away from you, we're just seeing the side of the door or the window. So it's not nearly as dark as the ones that we're seeing looking straight on. So just a little bit of details here and there. This is where you begin to ruin it. So I really try to restrain myself. So I have to ask a question. This is Art again. Um, I ask this with every guest artist. How do you know when you're done? <laughs> when I hit the bottom. <laughs> Actually, it's true. I mean, for the most, this one, I'm, I'm not, it's a little bit different, but usually by the time I hit the bottom, I'm, I, I stop anyway. Um, and I will not touch it again for several hours or the following day. And then I'll look at it again, see is it anything that's really important. And I might add a couple things here and there. But if I feel like I've got, I've got most of the values that I have on correct on, as I, on my value study, then, then I know that it works fine. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll quibble with some of these washes and things like that, but, but I know I can't change them. So, um, so again, look at these windows. I, they're not big, even though they would be very rectangular, I, I'm messing them up. So they're just not so, uh, so regular. And it's kind of, these something to the imagine, imagination. For the, is, there, is there something you're seeing through the church? Um, I actually try to leave a lot of the things to the imagination, which is one of the reasons I stop because I am actually a pretty literal person, and I, if I feel things aren't quite defined, my tendency is to go define them. Um, so I've learned to stop because I think suggestion is much more interesting than, um, you know, it's different between prose and poetry. So we have a question from Lenny Wendell. She's wondering when you're dropping in the windows with this darker paint, is the paint underneath still wet or? No, it, it's, it's good. By this point, it's, it's, it's probably, if, if it's not, it's mostly dry. It might not be bone dry. Um, 
because you can see this is mostly in real time. So, but it's it's mostly dry. And because I'm putting heavier pigment on it, even though there might be a little bit of moisture still left in the paper, it, it, it won't bleed. I mean, one way to, I mean, bleeding is one of those things that some people really like and most people try to avoid, but I think it'd be useful sometimes. So here, a few little final touches, you know, the ends of the roof could be, you, know, you, you see some of the scallop edge, but I think I mostly am looking at it and I think I'm mostly done. And then there's always the fun part of taking the tape off at the end. So I don't stretch my paper. It's just been taped on. Um, and I use Matt Painter's professional tape from Ace Hardware. Uh, I used to use, they used to have drafting tape. Scotch made it, but they stopped making it since architects didn't use it anymore. So I had to find a replacement. So this works pretty well. So I, I, I've double taped this. So I will take the, the outer tape off once it's completely dry. But here I can see the edges and really kind of judge it. Um, nice. Very nice. All right. I guess we can just stop here. People can like. So um, we have a question and answer period. Is that correct, Arthur? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have, before we get to that, we have one final question. Um, this is from Barb Parisian. She has your book. Is there anything you would add or change if you could in your book that you <laughs> published? <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, I, I wrote most of that book six or seven years ago. And one thing that I think is really important as an artist is to continually experiment and grow. Um, I think much of the basic information in the book is still, I, I really tried to get at some of the um, really germane aspects of watercolor that no matter how you paint, the better important. Um, as I've taught over the last several years, it's become more and more important to me. I realized the importance of composition. And so if I were to write the book again, um, I would spend more time on composition and explaining it. Um, it no, if you have a good composition, you can do almost anything to it and the painting is gonna work. And it does involve planning. I mean, I plan all of my paintings very carefully. Um, and as I've been teaching over the last few years, I've learned some ways, I think, to explain it to people that's useful to them. So if I were to do the book again, I would definitely spend a little more time on composition. Um, in fact, actually, I, I, my book company went, went bankrupt and they were, while I was preparing a second book on composition, <laughs> And um, they're now acquired by another company, Penguin, and we discussed it. And they just about two months ago told me that they don't want to go ahead with it. So, but I really think composition is such an important um, part of any kind of painting, and especially with watercolor, because with watercolor, other other media, you can change things. With watercolor, you really have to put it down that one time, and you can make slight changes, but you can't fundamentally change the composition. Um, along that same line, could you talk a little bit about what your thinking was with the composition with this painting? Well, um, one of the classic compositional tools is, and again, look, go, go look at representational work, is creating a triangle. And so when I first looked at my painting of the Golden Gate Bridge with the lighthouse, there, were, there was that composition, but the, the, the power just took me way, to, way, way off the page. So that's when I just kind of looked at this, I thought, okay, let's create a triangle. There were some buildings on the right-hand side, and I thought, okay, I'll just make a little French village. But it's, it's fundamentally this triangle. The other really important part about a composition is that you've got your foreground, your middle, middle ground, background. In fact, um, I will 
often create a background or a foreground, even if they're not there, because it is, if, if you don't include them, it's pretty obvious there's something wrong with the painting and everyone's going, oh, what's wrong with the painting? Well, it doesn't have the foreground. So, and it's really important then to have a, a strong focal point. So that's the other thing I decided, but, but to, and this four corners thing I mentioned earlier on, it, it's something you might want to experiment with. To create a more dynamic composition, if you have something different happening on all four corners, it really will become more dynamic. If you want a quieter painting, then having your, your corners similar anyway um, makes it a much quieter painting. It's a subtle thing, but it's it's a, it's really there. I've, I've, I've experimented with it a few times. Um, and, and lastly, I, the other thing, because this is invented also, although the, although the lights the same as my initial painting is crazy that, that where's the light coming from but the comp you know and which is kind of related because here it's all the shadow shapes that create my 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 composition so it's a really critical critical part to a, a composition yeah anything else yeah it's the triangle in this particular one Okay. You, can take, you can take away the background. You, you just squint your eyes. It, it's that one big shape there in the middle of the painting of the church and the buildings and the rocks. Right. Um, uh, let's see who this is that asks. Linda asks, um, as she observes you paint, it seems that your brush is nearly caressing every area and dropping the colors in an almost three-dimensional way. Well, that... That's an interesting point because um, something occurred to me a few years ago after teaching workshops. Um, with watercolor, unlike oil, pastels, or any other media pencil, you're just kind of guiding the paint along. You're not like, I mean, there are people who paint watercolor with big, big strokes, but the way I, 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 I think of it is I'm just kind of guiding the paint along. And so my brush is barely touching the paper. Um, you know, if, if you push too hard on a watercolor paper, especially while it's wet, you'll begin to lift the sizing and, and you start getting spotty stuff. So I think it's especially hard for, for people who are coming from oil painting to go to watercolor because they want to do these strokes. And um, you really have to kind of just guide the paint along. That was the whole thing with the bead too. I'm just kind of guiding the, the paint along. Um, I mean, when I was dropping things in, I, maybe it's three-dimensional because I, I'm taking it almost straight out of the tube and dropping it in there. But, uh, well, that's not always true, but, but it's, that's a special part of watercolor is that you can drop it in while it's still wet and it'll, you know, it, it, it has a mind of its own. Whenever you think you've mastered this medium, it'll come back and remind you that it's, it, who's boss. But, um, but I, I, I really like to take risks and chances because if you if they work, people go, "Wow, how'd you do that?" And if it doesn't work, it's just a piece of paper. So, um. so we have a question from Marie. Uh, uh, she wants to know if, uh, with all the straight lines in your work, particularly this piece, let's say, do you draw with a T square or a straight edge at all, or are you now just this, eyeballing it? This is all freehand. Um, that's a good point. There are people who can just draw straight lines without any problem. I'm not one of them. Um, so if, and again, similar to, so, so when I'm doing my uh, drawing on this, I will actually sometimes just take my fingers and, and just like, okay, it's this, as long as I, get, as I get a few straight lines right, then everything else follows because I can judge it against them. So if, like if there's a big long line, like like the Golden Gate Bridge you saw earlier, I, I have to be very careful about making sure it's straight because I'm not someone who actually draws straight lines very well. Generally speaking, I mean, I still can, but um, sometimes the guy is like, oh my God, Michael, that's way off. And I think that's another great advantage to not trying to draw rectangular windows. Yeah, no, that, exactly. No, I think it's true. Um, you know, I really like the freehand feel because if I, you know, in my architectural illustration career, it was all hard lines, straight edges. Um, 
so there's something just more fanciful about a pencil line. I mean, being able to draw, especially, you know, goes a, goes a long way in watercolor. Um, I, I have one student who, she was one of the earlier students, you know, 10 some years ago, and she couldn't draw. And she was in a workshop with me recently, and I was blown away how good she had become. And she said, I took two years of drawing. And um, it, was, it, was fun, it, was, it was phenomenal. So being able to draw, which sometimes is straight lines, at least putting lines where you think you want them to be is, uh, is important. Um, Barb asks if you have any hints on how to keep buildings in perspective for those of us who aren't architects. Oh, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, one, one advantage of doing Zoom virtual workshops is I give people the line work so they don't have to deal with perspective. And in my workshops, live workshops, I, we spend a lot of time on it. Um, and I'll go around and help people correct it. Um, I mean, to me, it's so easy, but I, I know for many people, it's not. And, you know, you always, even today, I, I will establish where my horizon line is. Where, where your eye level is and you know you're vanishing and i, I will yeah it, we'll, we'll do it in a workshop it, it's it, it, it you know if it's off your eye really pick, picks it up immediately um, so it's something that's very very important to me. in fact even on this one um all of the shadow shaded part of, of the building it's basically horizontal to your to the top and bottom, right? I mean, it's a straight line. But where it's receding quickly on the left hand side, I actually put a vanishing put a vanishing point. Uh, I'm putting it, let's see. I, I'm looking at my picture. Anyway, I, I put a vanishing point on the far left side, and so the building's uh, church. You, you can see that that roof pitch is slightly lower on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. you, perspective on the buildings in the background, they all go to that vanishing point. So this is, this is what's not, all, if it's not, your eye, your eye notices it. Um, there's a great book that I would recommend to anyone who's interested, it's called Under, Understanding Perspective uh, by Stephanie Bauer, B-O-W-E-R. She's one of these urban sketchers and also a former winner of the Gabriel Prize. Um, she did this book, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago now, and it's the best book on perspective I've ever seen. She really explains it really, really well, and with lots of wonderful drawings included. Could you? Um, because uh, a lot of people, a lot of people's eyes glaze over when you mention perspective, but it's really important, especially in landscapes and particularly in architectural subjects. So that was understanding perspective by yes. Stephanie Bauer. That's correct. B O W E R. B O W E R. Okay. Yeah. Actually, she just came out with a second book, but not about perspective. The perspective one, if you really want to know, understand perspective, I think it's one of the, and it's very easy to read. It's a, it's a small book. Um, you could bring it along with you um, if you're traveling. Do you do any urban sketching still, or are you doing mostly studio work now? Well, I do both. I mean, actually, strangely enough, during the, especially during the pandemic, I was mostly doing studio work. Um, whenever I do go out and paint, there's a group of people we go out and paint once a month. That, like that's how I, actually, a group of architects. We've been doing this for over 30 years. I, I will still go out and paint with them sometime. If I'm traveling, I always bring my watercolors, though. Um, it's just, but I haven't done that much traveling, so that's, one reason I've been in my studio a lot. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the thing about plein air is that if you do it a lot, you learn a lot about how light hits objects and the colors of things like trees. When you're, photographs are good, but they're not, they're not quite the same. And um, I think there's a huge benefit of painting outdoors. It's not always the most pleasant thing to do the, if the weather's not good. I imagine December in Minnesota is not the best. But, um, but if when the weather's good, it really, it, 
it, it would really help you hone your skills. So you develop a tolerance to the cold. I know people that go out, you know, not in the 20 below, but when it's below freezing, they'll they'll just bundle up and go, but maybe not doing so much painting as they might be doing sketching. sketching. Yeah, I've heard that below freezing, watercolor has a tendency to throw off crystals. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions out there? If, stop, the, stop, stop the share here and we can. Yeah, yeah excuse me. I, I don't know how to submit a question without just talking. Can I do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you mentioned a phrase um, uh, to create a triangle, and I didn't, I don't understand that phrase. Um, if you, I mean, and this goes way back, creating, creating a triangle as part of your composition. So usually one point of the triangle is your focal point, and then you've got a tertiary second point, and a, I mean, a secondary and uh, tertiary set focal point. I mean, that, that's the most obvious way of doing it. But just the general shape of things, um, you know, you, actually someone who's really good at this is Andy Evanson, who, who's not far from you. Look at Andy's paintings. Um, they're not obvious, but you'll see triangles almost every single time. He, he's, very, he's very cognizant of this. Um, it's just one of those things that people have understood in, in, in composition that creates an interesting basic shape to your painting. And so not every painting has a triangle, and there, but there are times if I see a way of creating a triangle, I will create a triangle. It just makes for a very strong composition. Now, I, I know it's not an accurate uh, three-sided thing, Right. At least yeah. I'm assuming that, but it, but somehow you're doing it with a focal point and then, well. Well, if you just look at the general shape of that church, and I guess I, I, could, I could see if I can share the screen here again. Yeah, please. Um, okay, can you see my cursor? All right. Can you see the cursor on... Yep. or not yes. Yeah. yes yes i can yes so so focal point so 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 basically here's the here's the triangle it, it, it's this it, it's not like you the and, and the thing about a triangle too it, it should be an irregular triangle if you do just kind of a regular triangle i mean the mona lisa actually go look at the mona lisa again it is a, a uni, uh, equilateral triangle i mean it's got <laughs> triangles everywhere I mean, it's the greatest example. And it's a very calm painting because it's all equal. If you want a more dynamic painting, you use a triangle that's, that's, that's very irregular. But just by the, the shape of everything in shadow it is, is kind of a, a triangular shape. Hmm. I mean, if, if, if I decided I wanted to, well, I, mean, I won't get into it, but it, I, I could definitely ruin this composition by adding a few other things to it, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> so, but, but if, go look at it, you know, a lot of representational paintings and a lot of people are, are at least cognizant of it. Um, yeah, I think I see it now. Uh, yep. Do you see it? I mean, sometimes- yeah, and, I, and I was mis misunderstanding of the, you know, looking for equilateral, but sure. You're kind of at the church, and then you rise up to the right-hand corner, and then the yeah, bottom it, is flat, it, it, you know, where the exactly. rocks are water. Exactly. Oh, exactly. thank you. Okay, thank you. And you have to teach me how to how to ask how to submit a question next time. Oh, that's fine. At at this point, people can unmute and talk to the artist. We don't have to use the chat function. Uh, anytime. Does anyone else have a question? We'll just give a minute here. So you said John Singer Sargent was um, probably your favorite artist. Yeah. Um, he does a lot of portraiture. Do you do you do any portraits? No, um, I don't have the portrait gene. 
I, <laughs> you know, um, I I can do them, but I'm not. It's not really my strength, not really my interest. Um, I do it occasionally um, on a special occasion, but it's not really what I do. My my painting really came from traveling and being outdoors, and so um, uh, I admire people. I mean. Uh, Dean Mitchell, I think is today, it actually is one of the best painters there is. And his portraits are just really, really incredible. Um, so if you want to look at the portraits, look at Dean Mitchell today. So. Where is he based? He's in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Google, Dean, Google Dean Mitchell. I, 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 for whatever reason, in the last year, I, I juried a lot of shows and they're, it's hard. <laughs> And someone's so good. I mean, I did, give him, I did give him best of show in one of them and one of the top prizes, but it's like his work for me anyway, it just stood out. Um, he's, he's really, he also does landscapes, um, architectural subjects that are really quite strong. Mm -hmm. And look do at his you, triangle. You'll see his triangles too. So. Do you do some um, cityscapes as well as uh, landscapes? Yeah, actually, that's really how I started out, mostly doing cityscapes. Um, and for cityscapes, you really do need perspective. I mean, if you go on my, on my website, you can see quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, to tell you the truth, more recently, what, what interesting more is the contrast between natural objects and architecture. So if I can have a building in a more natural setting, because I, I, I love painting trees, I love painting mountains and things like that. I also love painting architecture. So I, I'm doing fewer cityscapes and really trying to concentrate more on them. Actually, I have a show opening in two weeks. And so I've just done a lot of paintings over the last few months. And in almost every single painting, there's some kind of natural feature in the building. So I, I think there's a natural tension between the two. And when they work together, I think they're, that, that, that's what interests me in there. And I think um, during the last year, um, where we've all been indoors so much. I mean, one of the things that I think helped people get through all this was that com communing with nature. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I was just in Yosemite a, a few days ago and uh, it always recharge you. Yeah. Was it crazy busy? We didn't go to the valley. We actually stay on the eastern side of the Sierra and then go up to the high country around Fallen of Meadows and, and okay. you know, hike, hike, hike around 9,000 feet and things like that. So. Yeah, I've heard the national parks are just being swarmed. Well, Yosemite, actually, you have to reserve just to get into the park. So, wow. Yeah, um. So they're limiting the number of people. Okay, we have another question for you from uh, Linda Olson. She wants to know if you did your zebra painting on location no. or how did you come up with that composition? Okay, um, I was in Botswana two or three years ago and um, I love the zebras, but, but I'll, I'll make this brief. I, I did a painting um, of a piece, I used to, a piece, these zebras were sitting, I had a photo of these, these zebras and I just took a piece of a photo and did a painting. And then, and it was kind of fanciful and I kind of, you know, let myself uh, not be too religious about the whole thing. So then a few months later, I, I was thinking, I, I was looking at it again and I thought, well, if I take this and I flip it around and make it longer. <laughs> so um, I just basically had taken these, if you look carefully at the painting, you'll see these, zebras flipping back and forth repeating themselves so um yeah it's it's started with a see this is one thing about photographs too i think photographs are kind of insidious in that you see something and you think okay if i copy that i i'll have something that's good but it, the way to create your own kind of personal expression is to let them hint at things and then start and then do it for yourself i really i've done this for a long time and used to making things up so it's not true for everyone, but just be very careful when you're looking from a photograph to just take what you want from it rather than let it tell you what you should be painting because it's, um, 
So in that, with the zebra painting, I took a piece of, of the, a photograph. And then see, what I do is I- I'm gonna uh, share my screen and show it. I keep sketching, I, I keep sketching. Um, I, I'll sketch and sketch. In fact, I probably drew this like four times, um, but you, you see the, <laughs> then I flip it around. There's that guy, he's right, right, over, right over there. So anyway, um, and I move things around a little. And then the background, I wasn't quite sure what to do. So I thought, okay, I'll just kind of maybe hint that the, uh, the initial idea was that there were some zebras behind them, but then it just became this pattern. And I just thought I'll leave it at that. But I was talking earlier about warm and cools. I mean, going from warm to cool. This was something I was doing last year a lot. Um, and the only pure white is that one main zebra. So you see my focal point. So this is not a great example of triangles, although there are some triangles in here, but um, but they all link together. I think that's probably the more critical thing. Right. Okay, um, let's stop sharing. There we go. Any other yeah. questions, folks? I have one. Um, when you paint outdoors, you can't uh, do an underpainting and let it dry or or do you? Oh, I do. Yeah, I, I, I always do that. I've tried doing paintings without them and, and it's always missing something. It's just seeing those high notes, how I think it. So, it, it, you know, I, I, if, there, if it's sunny, I'll put it in the sun for a few minutes and, and let it dry. Um, sometimes I, you know, whenever I get kind of anxious and want to keep moving along, I just don't, I'll just wait for a little while, go talk to someone while it's drying and then it makes a big difference because otherwise you, you just pick up, you pick up the paint and um, you lose some of that vibrancy. Um, I have a question. When you do landscapes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and say, for instance, you have, you know, pine trees or spruces or, you know, other deciduous trees. Do you use the same approach as what you were doing now by dropping in different colors and just kind of keeping your bead that way? Or do you have a different technique for that? So you're talking about the difference between deciduous trees and- Well, not that necessarily di the difference. So I'm just saying, okay, so let's just say you just paint trees, you're painting the woods or something, and that could be part of the painting or could be the whole painting. I'm just wondering if you use the same type of technique. Yeah. You you know painting your trees like what you did here. Yeah, I it's uh, I, I'm kind of boring. I do the same thing every time. I just use different colors. Um, yeah. You know, if you're painting a portrait of a tree, that's one thing. But when I paint landscapes and there's lots of trees, I think of them more as shapes rather than individual trees. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. I have to make them believable, but. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I use actually ultramarine blue and quinacridone gold to make lots of my greens. And so okay. it's very much the same, same idea. And I work one, again, I've always worked, it goes down once and then I don't touch it again. So, um, that's really, I think important with trees for me anyway. Um, okay. Oh, it's also really important to know the shapes of trees. If you get the shapes of trees correct, then you can almost use any color you want to. Um, I love painting trees. So see, I, I see a lot of these things as devices rather than um, individual objects. Of course, I have to make them believable, but it, it, it's, it's really this, I think this, there's this basic abstract composition behind things. And so, I mean, I'll, I'll, if, if the trees don't, if there's some real trees, they don't have it, I just get rid of them. So, yeah. I, I should also say, when I was first learning, I, I had a lot of teachers say, oh, just get rid of those things. I know how hard it is. It's not easy for me. <laughs> so, I don't want to make it sound like I just automatically do it. I've included things too that just, um, I thought, why were you thinking? I said, just get rid of it. It's not helping anything. So, it's really hard not to include things that are actually there. Okay. Um, you mentioned Andy Evenson, and uh, someone is asking if you know him. 
he has mm -hmm. the same basic approach to painting as you do, the underpainting and only yeah. touching each area once. I had to, I've met Andy a couple of times. Uh, most recently, we were both in the AWS show in New York, um, and we went out for a drink afterwards. He's a, you know, Minnesota nice, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes. And just a really, you know, the, the, I don't want to go on on about Andy, but he makes it look so easy. Yes. <laughs> I took a workshop with him and, uh, you know, he was doing this and it's like, oh, how hard can this be? And then you start doing it yourself and it's a total mess. Yeah, he, but, you know, there's this whole thing, I think, you have to paint your personality a little bit and that, you know, people who are really organized people are going to create type of paintings. So, and, and, and the way I think you create your own style is by painting what you really feel. And I get that sense with Andy. So, mm -hmm. yep. Well, Art, do you think we should wrap it up? Yeah, I think so. Um, any other questions by our audience? No. Just want to say thank you so much. That yeah, was it was a great, it was a great demo. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you. Sorry, I, I wasn't able to come to Minnesota. I was supposed to come last May, and was then going to come this. Yeah, May, that didn't work. Everything yeah. changed. <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a uh, uh, comment from Robin Lackner. Thank you so much. Your work is awesome. This was inspiring, and uh, same from Judy Harvey. So, excellent job, Michael. We, all right. Uh, uh, thank you. Right. Maybe we should all unmute and give Michael a big hand. That's good. <laughs> thank you very much. It was, it was fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good night. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, good night. Thank you, Michael. Good night. Bye-bye. Night. Bye. -bye. Bye.